risen Christ is with us. Amen. Amen. Are y'all cold? <laughs> Me too. But what a joy it is to be with you. I'm sure that um, while our bodies will be cold, our hearts will be warmed today as we worship the risen Christ. Welcome to Memorial United. I'm Ron Beaton, one of the pastors here, along with Pastor Chris, who's off working on his doctoral education at the moment. And so we uh, pray for Chris during this time. But it's a joy to welcome you um, to worship today. I want to extend a special welcome to any guests who are with you with us. There's some attendance pads on the inside of the pews, and I hope that everybody will pass those down. And if you're a guest, that you'll fill out one of the Connect cards so we can get to know you a bit better. We've got a gift for you on your way out the door, but we're particularly glad that you're with us today. Um, and uh, yeah, so there you go. I want to welcome all of those who are joining us on our Facebook uh, live stream. We're so glad you're joining us, or if you're tuning in a little bit later on YouTube, we're glad you're joining us as well. If you want to get connected, you can go to our website memorialumc.church and then click on the connect tab. All right. I tried to talk a little longer today than I normally do because it's hard to keep instruments in tune in this weather. Um, but now you all tuned? We're good. We're ready to go. Let's stand together as we give praise to the living God. Where are you now? When be seated. Let's pray together. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Our gospel lesson today, I know this may throw you off just 
still spend yeah. time with you. All right. We're, we're shortening the service a little bit for you because, you know, we're just that nice. Our gospel lesson today comes from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42, I believe. The next day, he, he being John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I, became, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched, Jesus walked by and he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they turned and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? Which translate, um, they, sa- they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He was first found, he first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Let's stand as we sing.
welcome, Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire and fill us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. If you are not with us, then nothing else matters. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You know, there's an old book called the Didache, which talks, it was from the early church. It was so old, it almost made it into the Bible. Um, And they talk about baptism in there and the modes of baptism and how you should be baptized. And they said that the water should be cold um, because, you know, like there's nothing comfortable about being a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. So it should sting a little. I guess that's a reminder today, right? I don't know. I don't know. Somebody told me I needed more hellfire and damnation in my sermon this morning. Maybe, Maybe that's true, too. Today, we're starting a new sermon series entitled Follow. Um, Jesus calls us to follow him. What exactly does that mean? Who exactly is this Jesus that we are following? Why are we following? How do we follow? When we do, uh, when are we to follow? So Amy put a nice little fun graphic on the front of the bulletin, right? Because we follow people on Facebook. We follow people on Instagram. But does that, what does real faithful following mean? look like. And today's gospel reading uh, pointed for today seems like a good place to start, right? Um, Exploring the questions for this series. Last week we heard about Jesus being baptized. We had our baptismal renewal. We heard in in Matthew's gospel when Jesus came up out of the water of the Jordan, the dove descended upon him like it, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and the thunderous voice from heaven, right, this is my son, It was a cool story. It was exciting. Um, In John's gospel, though, we don't really have the baptism story unfold before our eyes like we do in Matthew. Rather, we have John who's just recalling and thinking about Jesus' baptism. So John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, and he says, Look, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a bold statement. John's making his mission pretty clear. He is the messenger. He is not the Messiah. He is not the new Moses. He is not the new Elijah, the new prophet. He is the messenger who is to come to prepare others for an encounter with Jesus. He is there to tell others who Jesus is. And here at the beginning of the gospel, John wastes no time doing his job. Look! Here is the Son of God, or here is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. I like the King James version of this one. Um, In the King James, it's, Behold the Lamb of God. The more modern translations kind of make it sound like, you know, John and his disciples are sitting at a park bench, and he's kind of like looking over his shoulder inconspicuously. Look, it's it's the Lamb of God. But with um, the King James Version, it's much more bold. It's like he's on a megaphone. Behold, right? Behold the Lamb of God. Stand in awe. Stand in wonder. Behold the Lamb of God. Notice he doesn't say behold your king here. Um, Or he doesn't say behold the Messiah. John says behold the Lamb of God. For those hearing these words for the first time, there's no mistaking Um, what metaphor that John is making. Way back in the book of Exodus, the Hebrew people were enslaved by the Egyptians. Remember this? God has a spokesperson. His name's this guy named Moses, right? He demands, and Moses goes and demands to Pharaoh, let my people go. And then God sends ten plagues on Pharaoh and the Egyptians, culminating with the slaying of the firstborn son by an avenging angel of death. Israelites, however, mark the door frames of their homes with the blood of a perfect, unblemished lamb so that the angel of death would pass over, right? That's where the Jewish holiday of Passover comes from. The angel of death would pass over their home. John is saying that Jesus is the new, perfect, unblemished lamb. Jesus is the one who will be the total sacrifice for the source of life. This weak, vulnerable lamb, ready for slaughter, is also to be the lamb who will reign in the heavens and bring judgment on the wicked and secure salvation for the righteous. 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The one who confronts Caesar's army, his legions, is but Mary's little lamb. A lamb who takes away the sin of the world. I read a preacher this week who noted it wasn't the lamb who took away your sin or the lamb who takes away my sin or even the lamb who takes away the people of the world's sin. It's the lamb who takes away the sins of the world. What are the sins of the world exactly? What are the world's sins? Um, this probably tells a little bit about me, uh, but one of my favorite TV shows is the, was The Good Place. Anybody ever watch The Good Place? In the show, the main characters have all died, um, and they went to The Good Place as opposed to going to The Bad Place. Um, but they realized when they got there, it was a mistake. Um, they were supposed to go to the bad place, but they went to the good place by mistake. Um, and subsequently, hilarity ensues, right? So I would not recommend um, forming all of your theology on heaven and hell and eternity based off of this TV show. Um, but what the show does well behind its farcical humor is it causes us to ask good questions about ethics and love and how we live together as humans. And in one of the scenes, um, the characters discover that nobody in modern history has had enough good points to go to the good place, right? Not Mother Teresa, not Gandhi, nobody, right? But it wasn't some sinister plot by the demons in the bad place to populate the bad place. Rather, they discover that people are not getting into the good place because the world has grown more complicated. As an example, in the story, the reformed demon-turned-good guy, Michael, is searching through the good place's accounting department, and he walks through all of the various deeds committed in history by people named Doug. And so he discovers that back in 1534, there was a guy named Doug who picked a dozen roses for his grandmother. Positive points. In 2009, another man named Doug gave his grandmother a dozen roses, and he lost points. The second Doug did something very similar to the first Doug, but the roses that he bought were through a cell phone made in a sweatshop. The roses were filled with toxic pesticides, picked by exploited migrant workers, transported in a way that left a massive carbon imprint, and his money went to a racist billionaire CEO who does really bad things, all right? The conclusion that Michael makes was, quote, every day the world gets a little more complicated and being a good person gets a little bit harder. Perhaps those are the sins of the world. Even if people are morally upright, we are still immersed in and unwittingly contribute to an immoral society. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here comes the one who seeks to redeem not just your souls, but creation and all that is within it. That which we didn't even know needed a good cleansing will be scrubbed by the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John then tells the disciples about the baptism experience he had. It was this spectacular event, right? And John concludes that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. God who told John to baptize with water. Now, John uh, now told John, the guy who's going to baptize, that Jesus is the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. John says, all I've got is water, but this guy who's coming will baptize with the Holy Spirit with something so much greater, with something so much more powerful that will change your life. The next day, something very similar happens. Sitting there again, once again, John's with his disciples, with his students, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And so this time, the disciples, they leave John, and they start following Jesus. They had heard their teacher John talk ad nauseum about this Jesus fellow, 
And so they start following him, not in like a proverbial way following him, but literally following him. They are walking closely behind this guy. And Jesus turns around to these two guys who are like right on his tail and says, um, what are you looking for? <laughs> Which on first take sounds a bit like, um, can I help you? You're kind of creeping me out a bit. <laughs> but on a deeper level, that's the question, isn't it? What are you looking for? In John's gospel, these are the very first words that Jesus says in the book of John. What are you looking for? First words out of Jesus' mouth. Perhaps they are Jesus' first words to us as well. What are you looking for? The car salesman that sold Casey um, our cars, both of our vehicles, when you show up, this is his question. Hey, well, what are you looking for? <laughs> and I asked him one time after we had bought the car, I said, what's your sales trick? When you like get people in here, how do you make the sale? And he says, you get the people what they want. If you get them what they want, they'll buy it. <laughs> Simple as that. I sometimes worry that that's what we do with the church, right? How is the church going to grow? Well, we give the people what they want. Um, but with Jesus much greater than all-wheel drive and cup holders, right? He wants people to follow him and his path of love freely. He calls us to look deep into our own hearts, into our own souls, and be aware of what our fundamental desires are. What do we really want in our lives? And you know the answer that you're going to give to that question is going to be different, right? That's never going to be your final answer. If you're looking around the clock for around the clock happiness, or if you're looking for a health insurance plan, or a way to be in a better financial shape, I don't think Jesus is what you're looking for. But keep digging. Dig deeper into your soul. Maybe those are just distortions of what you really desire. I wonder... Instead of happiness, if you're searching for that joy that will sustain you in happiness or in sorrow. If so, maybe Jesus is what you're looking for. If it's not so much a guarantee of, good, of a good healthy body, but an assurance of abundant life, maybe Jesus is what you're looking for. If it's not wealth that you really yearn for, but rather something that you can trust in, something that will foster beautiful relationships with God and with neighbor, if you're searching for something that really will provide your daily bread, then perhaps the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the one who's offering you new life, is who you're looking for. What are you looking for? The disciples did something to Jesus that Jesus normally does to other people. They answered the question with the question, what are you looking for? And they said, where are you staying? <laughs> They're not worried about his street address. They want to know how they can spend more time with Jesus. Where are you going? From this point on in the gospel, it seems that people are always wanting something from Jesus, right? So he feeds the multitude, and then the multitude starts following him because they want more food. Or the religious leaders or the political leaders of the day, they start following Jesus in, a, in an attempt to trap him or to kill him. But these two disciples, they want to know, where are you staying? They want to have a relationship. They want to follow Jesus wherever he leads them. Where are you staying? Where can we find you? Where shall we go to be with you? To receive what you have to offer? Where can we be in the very presence of God? And Jesus responds, remember what he says? Come and see. And the next question, and then the next verse, well, they came and they saw. And they hung out with him until it was quitting time. They stayed until it was four in the afternoon. Why should we follow Jesus? Why should we trust anything John the Baptist says? Maybe if somebody says, why should I try out your church? Or where do you go to church? Maybe instead of saying, I go to Memorial United Methodist Church, maybe your response should be, 
come and see. I'll pick you up. Come and see for yourself. I'll pick you up and you can see for yourself where I go and I have an encounter with the living God. Perhaps they will come and see something special. Maybe they'll think, wow, it's cold there, but it sure is beautiful. Maybe in spite of my pathetic ramblings and our broken boiler system and our congregation's feeble attempt at singing, Jesus will show up. Maybe they'll say, I think I want to follow Jesus. And maybe, like these two disciples, they'll go tell their friends or their family, hey, come and see. Come and see what God has done, what God is doing, what God is going to do. But you know, it's not always church, is it? I love the story of a wealthy woman who found Mother Teresa in Calcutta, and she whipped out her checkbook. And she starts to write a check, and Mother Teresa waved her off and said, No money. No money. No money, the shocked and unfond over woman replied. No money. But what can I do? And Teresa smiled, reached out her hand, and said, Come and see. And she walked into an impoverished neighborhood She found a poor, hungry child, picked up the child, put her in the woman's arms, and said, care for her. The woman reported later how transformative that was, of course. We're going to talk about following Jesus. But rather than talking about it, perhaps we come and see what God in the flesh is doing. Amen. Let's pray together. Most holy and gracious God, we're thankful um, for the call you've placed on our lives to follow you. Whether life is good or life is hard, whether life is happy or sorrowful, whether we are warm or cold, we give you thanks that you're with us. We give you thanks that your son, Jesus Christ, entered this world. And so now we seek to follow him with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let's stand together as we sing, and as we do, we're also going to take our offering this morning. As a forgiven and reconciled people, we'll offer our tithes and offerings to God. You can give in the offering plate as it's passed around. You can go to our website, memorialumc.church, and click on the Give tab, or you can text your offering to 73256 and put in the message, Memorial UMC, one word, and the amount you want to give. Let's confess our faith with the song we believe.
thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch.
Um, a couple announcements I, before I send you on your way. Um, the, I invite everybody to take a look at the bulletin and several announcements in the life of the church. There's um, small groups that will be starting up soon and, and different things that I hope you all would consider getting involved in, different things. Um, the two things I want to highlight, first of all, um, as many of you all um, know, Casey has been leading our youth group for the last year and a half or so. Um, and uh, I'm, of course, pretty fond of her, um, but um, not just because she's my wife, but I think she's done a really fabulous work with our youth group um, and, and helping to build that and really kind of uh, get a, a good youth ministry going here. But when she started, we knew that there was an interim, kind of on an interim basis. And now we're, um, she is going to continue this till the end of the school year. And um, so we're in this beginning the search for looking for somebody um, who would be good at youth ministry. And so if there's somebody that you know in your life um, that would be good for that role, be sure to come talk to me or maybe send them our way. Um, they need not be Methodist to apply. I'll make a Methodist out of them. Um, so anyway, we'll see how that works. Um, but um, at least to begin having that conversation. So I'd love to have more. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that we are starting our capital campaign. Since before I got here, um, uh, years before I got here, one of the talks that had been the trustees and the church council had been on their list for a long time is redoing the children's wing upstairs um, and to making it a really fun, inviting, exciting place for kids and their families. And we've done little things here and there, but the time has finally come for us to, um, now as our church has been growing and we've got lots of new young families um, and young kids in the church, we found it to be in a really good time for us to remodel and uh, redecorate upstairs. Um, so we're starting our Building the ca Kingdom campaign. You know, we have, um, we have kids of the kingdom, and so upstairs you're going to follow the river that leads you all the way to the castle and the big room. The big room will be decorated as the castle, and there's going to be um, some fun play equipment there inside there. It's going to be a really awesome thing, one of the best uh, children's wing I think you'll find just about anywhere. But, of course, that's going to cost quite a bit of uh, money. And so um, over the next year, I hope that you'll begin considering um, – being able to give to that are ways that you can help with this capital campaign. We're officially kicking that off at the end of this month. So I wanted to let you know that that is upcoming and something I'm really excited about and I think a lot of our church will be excited about too. So, all right, I'm the only thing standing between you and warmth. So I will take a helicopter to China if I need to to get that water pump um, to get our place warm. So next week you can say come and see, um, invite somebody um, to a warm sanctuary, a warm place, um, and worship God together. Now may the God of all grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you all. Amen. Go in peace. There's nothing that our God can do.